Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Lockdown Lessons, part 55 now. With me today, I've got Adib Bamier from Bamboo Orchard. So firstly, a big hello to you, Adib. Hi, Phil. Thank you very much for having me. No problem at all. So the first question I've got for you is something I'll ask everybody just to introduce themselves. There will be people that are watching this that don't know anything about Bamboo Orchard and want to find out. So perhaps you could fill us in on, on what you do, what Bamboo Orchard does and how you help people, Adib. Uh, so Bamboo Orchard is a venture studio, um, which essentially is a, uh, um, a, a, a place for CEOs to bring their problems, I think is the shortest way to, to describe it. Um, I was a, a COO uh, operations director for the vast majority of the past sort of 20 years, and um, I created a, um, a, a studio where all the problems that I used to face as a COO um, could be solved in one place. So we have uh, HR people, finance people, um, uh, sales and marketing teams. We have engineering teams and across the entire business, which is about 50, 50, odd, uh, 50 odd staff with directors in each department, um, we can sit down with the business, create a strategy for solving a problem and then actually implement and solve that problem. So we don't just offer moral support. We actually do the work with, with, our, with our founders and with our, with our companies. Good stuff. Thank you very much. Um, so um, if you could sort of cast your mind back to March 2020, uh, where we were getting some, some strange news coming out of the uh, Far East, shall we say, mm -hmm. at what point around then did you think, mm, this, this actually might affect us, it might, it might affect the country, um, it might affect us commercially in one way, shape or form? Um, I should, that was, I have a strong memory of March 2020s. It's both the, the month of my birthday and also the month I got COVID. Um, so I got it. I got it really early in the, in the cycle. Um, uh, I actually realised there was a problem probably in January. Um, I flew from London to California, and I remember buying a mask and thinking this is a really weird thing to do. And I kept. I didn't. I didn't wear it. But I remember buying one. So there must have been enough in the news for me to be concerned. Um, so I bought the mask and I, and I flew out to, to California and it was like nothing was happening there. No one, no one, uh, like nothing was, was, uh, was in the news or in the, in the public eye. It was when I flew back that I saw people starting to behave strangely and I got back into the UK and I thought this is going to, this something is not, not quite right. Um, and to be honest though, I'm quite a positive and optimistic person. So I would say that it wasn't really until I got sick where I realized that it was a, there was a serious problem. And I probably got sick as part of my journey backwards and forwards. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think, I think the, the, the illness to myself, had I not got ill myself, I'm not sure I would have taken it particularly seriously at the time. Because I certainly wasn't up until that point. Absolutely. Well, I, I don't know. I've not speak, spoken to anyone that actually had it as early as March. So that's quite, that's quite interesting. But, um, but you got over it okay? Or was it a real struggle at the time? Uh, it was it was it was a it definitely wasn't a, um, a, a light symptom ordeal. I didn't get any breathing problems, but it was um, it was seven days of of uh, fever and uh, like sort of hallucinating strange things for a few days. And uh, I was I was in this house on my own. So I just had to suffer it for, for seven days. But after that, I felt fine. There were odd moments through the week where I actually thought, oh, I could probably I could probably go to the gym. I feel I feel OK. <laughs> and then about an hour later. Feel like at all. Oh dear, dear, dear. Oh, but then I suppose if you have it, if you've had it that early on, then you you feel as though you're invincible afterwards, and you're and, and the lockdown's even more frustrating because you think, well, yeah. you know, you you you're, you're a lot of people are under probably a misapprehension. If you get it once, you can't catch it again. You probably would have been at the time, right? That's what I'd have thought anyway. Well, the the the, the science is now that that we we do gain an, an immunity from it, which is why uh, Omicron has been seen by a lot of developing countries as a boon. It's a good thing, not a bad thing, because it's it's considerably less severe than the regular strain. And if you catch it, it makes you just as immune. So for the countries that can't afford to vaccinate an entire population, having everyone catch Omicron was actually a, a really useful thing. A lot of our company is based in Egypt and Egypt, um, the Egyptian health minister came out and said, Omicron saved us, right? So wow. it, 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 made a, it made a big difference to us because a lot of Egyptians didn't want to get vaccinated. They were worried. Well, Omicron solved that problem, right? It just went through the population basically pseudo vaccinated everybody and they could crack on with their lives sounds like a sort of a giant chicken pox party that you have for, for yeah, children, exactly for children yeah. <laughs> that's yeah just incredible yeah it, that's very interesting so so i suppose um how did the how did forgetting about the actual illness itself but how yeah. did lockdown and, and the, the, what was going on commercially affect you at bamboo orchard Adib? um it's 
it's hard to it's hard to quantify it over the entire of the two years, but yeah. certainly right at the beginning, um, we have a lot of companies in our portfolio that are are travel companies. So that's where I was first super concerned. Um, one of our one of our biggest companies is a company called Quick Bus, and they do they're essentially Skyscanner, but for buses, and they're Africa based. So in Africa, people tend to use um, buses instead of train uh, instead of planes to, to move in internationally um, so they do the same service that Sky Scanner does but, but you, you're booking bus buses instead of trains so obviously with with that problem starting and then countries starting to lock down their borders their business started to fall away um, we had a um, uh, we had a ski company um, within our wider portfolio that also struggled they don't they actually cease to operate entirely um, there were a few others as well. So we we started to realize that that part of our business was going to be a problem, but it only still only made up about 20% of our, our total portfolio. The rest of the companies, I mean, some of them did very well. I mean, one of our one of our portfolio companies is a company called Hey Summit. And Hey Summit is it's a not a, it's a product that uses Zoom or other video um, softwares to um, to create online conferences. So suddenly they went from growing quite nicely and they were and they were um, they were growing sort of say doubling year on year to suddenly they were doubling sort of like quarter on quarter. There was the, the acceleration was quite, was quite oh. rapid. So so some businesses did very well within our portfolio and some didn't. Um, so over the course of the last two years, how much that has affected our ability to grow Bamboo Orchard and, and have new members join, it's difficult to say. Right, because we actually did about the same amount of business this year as last year, but for us who have grown year on year since our inception in 2018, that's actually it flat being flat between between last year and this year makes me feel like it, it had a negative effect um, because otherwise we, we every other year has shown growth. Absolutely. So so how did you adapt to those changes in, in what was going on when, when when a few customers were having to cancel or delay or what have you? Um. Internally, we didn't have to change anything uh, because Bamboo Watch is, has always been a remote business. We have, uh, I don't, I don't think there are many cities in the world that has more than two Bamboo Watch employees. We are very, very spread out. Um, so that didn't didn't change anything. The way we deliver um, didn't change anything. What we started to focus our energy on was was trying to get all of our companies to understand how they could take advantage of the current situation. Right? How could they take advantage of the um, the move to remote? Right. So the example I gave earlier of, of Hey Summit, there's an online conferencing company. They were well positioned to be to be ready for that. So they then had to make all their messaging about about that. They had to make their new sales target, their, their, their new um, audience um, uh, for their sales campaigns. People that are in the sort of in person industry, which wasn't previously their their, their audience. Let's go to those companies and let's see if we can acquire new business from companies that don't know what to do. Now all of their conferences are being cancelled. Um, for uh, for Quick Bus, they can't. They couldn't make. They couldn't make a bus uh, a bus trip happen because the the government was stopping those trips from happening. So what could they do? So could they focus on uh, building a uh, an audience with their customers between between now and and um, uh, the lock, lockdown ending could they develop those relationships in a different way um the short answer was not really um the the, the most people if sky kind of started trying to build a community of travelers in a period when there were no travels they, they would have struggled right um but uh, but what they could do is they could help the other side of their marketplace which is the bus companies right so they could go to the bus company and say you're struggling, here's how we're going to support you. So we started focusing everything around how we were going to support those bus companies and what we would do for them. And we just pushed that across every single one of our, of our companies in our portfolio. There are 20 companies in the, in the total portfolio for us. So each, each business had a strategy on who was suffering most within your audience, whether if you're a, if you're a marketplace, you probably have two sides of that audience. And if uh, otherwise, uh, you might just have one particular type of customer. Um, but what are their pain points and how can you help them? How can you support them? And how can you build a relationship and have something, have some engagement with them in this period when there's no business happening. Got it, got it. So, so in terms of any changes that you made within Bamboo Orchard over the two years that were sort of not necessarily forced on you because of lockdown, but something which you thought would, would be a useful change, a way to pivot your business or, or move slightly or make some tweaks during lockdown that would help. Um, is there anything you, you've done in the, over the last two years, I suppose, that 
that you would have maybe done earlier than than, than COVID, you know, 2018, 2019, if you'd have thought about it? So the big thing was forcing remotes. So as I said, we're, we've always been a remote business, but our clients have not always been remote businesses. So um, I, I have always conceded to companies that, okay, if you, if you insist on me coming physically to your office, I will do so, but I didn't really want to do it. Um, with COVID happening, I, I just, I didn't have to force the issue. It just, it just happened. We're now remote. We, you now have to deal with this remotely. It's, it's, you don't have a choice. Um, I, I should have put that pressure on businesses prior and, and just said, look, this is just how we operate. And then I would have, I would have probably saved quite a lot of travel costs on, on the business, but, but in general, it would have created a good, a uh, good working relationship or a more efficient working relationship with the companies because, because of the way that we work. And I think probably most companies work travel time really cuts into efficiency. So, encouraging our businesses to go remote faster would have been, I think, the thing that I would like to go back and have changed. But the situation as it was, it made it easier for me to, to, to sell the concept of remote working. Absolutely. It's strange, actually, regarding the sort of face-to-face versus remote. What I, what I do is, is I, I coach business owners on a week-to-week or fortnight-to-fortnight basis. And there were a few people that were actually, that did want to come into the office and do it face-to-face. Mm-hmm. And then actually, as soon as we went into lockdown, I said, look, it has to be remote. They opted out and said, look, I didn't sign up for this. I wanted to do face-to-face. So it's mm-hmm. quite interesting. And there are other people that are very time pressured that still insist upon seeing face-to-face. You think, that doesn't make sense, right? Because <laughs> you're right. Travel yeah. is, the, is the easiest way to, 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 to sort of mitigate those time issues, really. So I totally agree. So there, there, I, is, there is definitely is a benefit to being face to face. But the question always is, does it outweigh the downside of the extra cost and time attached to traveling? Yeah. And I think with some people, the answer to that is absolutely not. And other people, yeah, they, they say it does make a difference. So it's a, it's a strange one. It's one of those sort of intangibles to, that it's difficult to get your head around. Like it's not really obvious why some people prefer face to face and others don't. It just, it just is almost, and we've just got to live with it almost. It, I suppose it depends to how, how you, some people like to uh, sort of learn audibly, some people like to learn visibly, and some vi- visibly, excuse me, visually, and some people yeah. like to learn kinesthetically. And it seems to be the people that learn kinesthetically that want the face to face, the handshake, and all that sort of stuff. And it seems to make a big difference. And, and I don't know why, but it's a strange. There's, there's probably an element of introvert and extrovert um, attached to this as well. Um, some people don't even like to pick up the phone and have a phone call. They, they know that, that that action makes them nervous. So maybe in that, a Zoom call has that same effect on them. It makes them, just makes them nervous to have that kind of call. Absolutely. So, so did you notice just out of interest then in terms of when you were being introduced to new prospects and you were having conversations with them over Zoom, did you find that your uh, your take up rate conversion rate changed as a result of doing some, some more more things on Zoom and less things face to face? It make no difference. I hadn't thought about it. I hadn't thought about it. I would. My guess is it didn't make a difference. Um, actually, no. Actually, no. Now, I, now, now that I, I think about it, no. I think it. I think it did make a difference. And where it made a difference is not on the way people absorbed the information that I was pitching to them right, or the ideas that I was I was selling to them um, it was more the um, because of the re- reduction this is this is an efficiency gain for the buyer not for the seller but the efficiency gain for them was that because these calls are now remote and they're more efficient to do because you can do four or five in a morning rather than face-to-face calls which would have to be spread out over a greater period of time they could speak to three or four different companies that might offer a similar service to me. So potentially, potentially I may have lost business because they they heard four or five pitches in the same morning and went with a different um, supplier. Um, fortunately, Bamboo Watch is one of only a very small number of venture studios in the whole world. So uh, it doesn't happen too often, but that potentially, yeah, potentially that could be, that could have happened in very specific situations where people were coming to us for a something that's more um, of a commodity for example engineering if somebody wanted a new website built or a new mobile app built then yes you could find a dozen companies to do that so if they heard our pitch on that and another company's pitch on that they may have just gone with another company so yes that is certainly more likely if they'd gone to all the effort to come to our offices or we'd sat and we've met in a in a location in london and we sat down for a couple of hours and had coffee and and shared stories in the way that you build relationships in person it would have been much harder for that person to then go off and find another um, another supplier because they've already bonded with me and ultimately as much as we want to think that we buy logically we don't we buy emotionally so even in a business kind of context we buy emotionally 
absolutely that I'm, I, i've um a lot a lot of my my clients when, when we start to talk about sales it's uh, they're trying to sell the the product and the service and the, the logic behind it and mm -hmm. i totally agree with you you know you people buy emotion and justify with logic afterwards right um and uh, and it's often the emotional side of selling that people people seem to fall short on i think anyway so mm -hmm. what would you say your biggest sort of your biggest challenge going forward would be right now um, my biggest challenge going forward is it's what one thing that, that has been uh, a boon to us and is now creating a challenge for us is over the because of the the, the the remote switch and a lot of new people deciding I want to leave my my employer or my my whatever their full time role was and I want to go off and, and do something that's in a remote position. For us, it's been great. We've been able to grow our business. The number of employees we have has, has increased over over the last few years, um, because everybody wants to move to work for a remote business, and they like the idea. We're, we're um, Bamboo Watch is not just a remote company; we're, we're a flexi hour company too. So, and we work we work asynchronously. So, you could work for Bamboo Watch in any time zone in the world, and you could um, uh, work to whatever schedule you wish. You could spend the day with your children or in the gym or whatever you like doing, and then only work in the evenings for us. So we give all of our team that, that flexibility. So that's been brilliant, but it means that suddenly we've gone from originally being focused entirely on commercial, commercial strategy, brand strategy, uh, positioning, and um, product development, to then expanding into HR and governance and finance and uh, uh, outbound and inbound marketing and a whole bunch of other things, SEO. We've managed to expand our team and we keep bringing in all these specialists. The problem now is that, that the challenge I now face going forward is when I sit down with a, with a, new, uh, a new potential client, they say to me, what do you do? And I say, we do everything, right? <laughs> we literally do everything um, because we, can, we build companies from the ground up. Um, so we have to have every single potential service in the business. That is now causing me a problem because you don't, nobody buys everything. No one, no one say, no one wakes up in the morning and goes, oh, I really need an everything company. Let me just go and find everything, right? It just, that's just how it works. Um, I used to be the COO of a company called Henchman in, in London. And we were at the sort of the dawn of the delivery service businesses. We were a um, very similar service to Deliveroo. The difference was that everyone will only bring you food from a restaurant that it's attached to, right? It has a relationship with. We would bring you anything from anywhere. And we found that very difficult to sell, right? Because people, when, when, they, when they think, when they ask you, you know, you work at delivery, what do you do? Oh, well, it's an app of getting food from, from restaurants. So if you want some nice food from a nice restaurant, use Deliveroo. Okay, and that's, I wake up in the morning, I want food from a nice restaurant, I order from Deliveroo. From Henchman, it was, well, we just bring you anything, anytime. So your, your imagination is, in, is, is all that, that is uh, stopping you from having whatever you want. And sometimes people would be very imaginative and they would say, uh, we want, I want popcorn, I'm going to watch a movie tonight, I like popcorn, but I don't want popcorn from the supermarket, I want the popcorn from the cinema because that's much nice popcorn. So we would go to the cinema and buy a massive thing of popcorn and then take it to the house and give them the popcorn, right? The problem is if you most people are not that imaginative so so people would just sit there going i just want food so i'm just going to use delivery room right um so yeah so it, it was it i had that problem a little bit with 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 bamboo orchard now where the challenge i'm facing is we've grown so wide that people are coming to us and saying what do you do i say everything so whatever your problem is just tell me what it is and they go oh, I just the, the, their imagination just doesn't doesn't take them onto what they could do so my my energy now has to be focused on narrowing us back down again and saying look this is where this is where bamboo orchard will help you step one and then that we have all this this other um, these other services in the back that will help and support your business but we have to bring it back to being focused on one thing um, and that's probably advice for any company right you should always try and be as focused on a single thing as possible Exactly. I mean, I see lots of lots of people that have been marketing online over the last few years, developing a lead magnet where and for those of people that aren't actually that are watching this that don't know what I'm talking about. It's essentially a, a, a book, a PDF, something they can give away for free that leads people into the rest of their, their offering. And what happens then once you've bought some airtime with those people that have downloaded a lead magnet, once you've actually got them into a phone or a meeting conversation, you can then explain to them a little bit more about the, about what you do and how you work. And I think sometimes that's uh, it's developing that. I don't know, it needn't be something for free. It could be a lead product, something which pretty much everybody wants. And then looking to looking to develop conversations from that purpose. But, it, you know, it's complex. You might need one for in, 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 a, a different lead magnet in different industries or different lead magnets around one on HR, one on operations, one on marketing, one on sales and what have you. So it, it is complex, right? 
Mm-hmm. I mean, restaurants. You know, restaurants. Um, I mean, restaurants have done it too, but uh, but supermarkets were f- famous for it. They'll they'll find a a product that is particularly popular and sell it for something ridiculously cheap um, to draw people in, and then when they're in, they'll sell them other things while they're there. Um, so, I mean, to a certain extent, that's that's what I'm talking about. Um, to a greater extent, it it aids your entire business if you can focus all of your communication on one simple concept. Uh, if, if, if you know the one thing you do and you can explain it clearly in a sentence and to explain what you do in a sentence is not to describe the actions that you take, it is to describe the problem that you solve. So if you can describe the single problem that you solve, then it's easy for someone to think of you when that problem occurs. And that's what you want to do. It doesn't matter if you're selling trainers and you're Nike or you're a, um, a, a business uh, a business advisory service, the same, the, same, the same process happens when you go to, buy, to purchase something. Um, the, your, your customer will think, I have to go running. My problem is I don't have shoes. I think of Nike, right? You need that, that same thought process to happen with everybody that's in your audience as well, right? I know that, um, that, that Phil uh, exists. I know that he has business coaching services and he solves this particular problem for me, right? When I'm having struggling with growth, I'm going to go and spoke, speak to, to Phil. Right now, I don't struggle with growth, but I know he exists. Tomorrow, I'm having a growth problem. We're having a conversation in the, in a, in the office. We're having profit issues. What are we going to do? Well, well, let's go and talk to Phil because it's the, it's the one thing I know Phil for and that's what he's good for. Phil may do other things, Right? But the thing that I know him for, the way I describe his business, the problem that he solves is this one problem. And if every business can find that one problem that they solve and be known for that one problem, everything else will fall into place. Apple, as, a, as an example, is, is and, and Nike, we'll use those two examples. They're the, they're the, the biggest two and probably the best, most, the most um, well-created brands on the planet. Um, both are known for one thing. One is known for trainers and the other is known for phones. They sell a lot more than that. But you only know them for one thing. You don't. When you say Apple, you think phone. When you say Nike, you think shoes. You don't think of T-shirts and shorts and tracksuits and and uh, hats and all the other things that you might get from those products. So, so you just need to get yourself into that position. Get yourself known for one thing. Perfect. You you, you put that very succinctly. Well done. So so um just the final two questions I suppose for you then Adib. Um, mm-hmm. if your ideal customers watching this right now. What what do they look like? What types of businesses do they work with, within? What type of roles do they operate within their business? Um, I know you're probably going to say everybody again, right? <laughs> no, no, I'm not. I'm not because I know it's the wrong answer. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. So, so yeah, I mean, if you could just talk me through what your ideal customer might look like and how exactly do you help them? So in terms of who they are, they are the, the founders and CEOs of businesses. Um, I personally work with CEOs Um if you like, as a, as a coach, although I don't refer to myself as a coach, I don't describe myself that way. Um, some companies will call me their chief strategy officer, but I basically sit down with CEOs and talk them through problems, right? I've built a lot of companies in excess of 20, 25 companies in the last, in the last 20 years, um, both through Bamboo Orchard and in my previous career. So I've seen most of the problems that will happen to a company within the first five years of its lifetime or within the first 150 employees. I've grown businesses to about those, those sizes. Um, so generally speaking, that's the primary thing I look for. Companies that are in those early few years of their, of their life cycle and they want someone who has been there before and can solve their problems. Behind me, I have Bamboo Orchard and Bamboo Orchard is the, the tool that I use to help solve those problems. But the primary thing I do is I help CEOs hit their goals, right? And overcome the challenges or be aware of the potential upcoming obstacles. It's very easy to plow forward when you know you know the potential problems that are coming up. The yeah. problem is the is the uh, is the unknown unknowns where you have no idea it's coming and then it it surprises you. So that's that's what I come in for. I'm I'm sort of a, an early warning detection system for for problems um, and I'm a problem solver for the ones that you have found already. Fantastic. Yeah, something you said that reminded me of the words um, unconscious incompetence of not mm-hmm. knowing what you don't know and um, not realising there are potential problems around the corner and there are potential solutions for problems that you don't even know exist, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, to be honest, my best my best founders, my best CEOs that I, that, I, that I work with, the ones that engage with me the most are the ones that are more aware. The more they learn 
the more they they sort of develop themselves and understanding of their business, the more they realize they have gaps. And those are the, those are the best uh, the best CEOs for me to work with, the ones that that are are really investing in themselves. A lot of actually a lot of my CEOs will sit down to me, with me and say, "Give me a reading list, and I'll they'll give them books to to sort of read through um, while well, coach them through." Uh, I, I'm a, a ex personal trainer, ex nutritionist as a part time. wasn't I was, it was a, a career, but I did it. I trained in those two two fields for myself, and I now find myself talking through nutrition and meditation and personal coaching with my like personal training with my uh, clients as well because if you can perform better as a human being um then you'll perform better in every aspect of your of your life kind of thing so so yeah so a lot of my work is just helping people get better at being being themselves and therefore being a ceo right um so yeah so it's a it's a uh, it's really compelling but as you say the more that you know the more you know you don't know yeah absolutely that's right Totally agree. I totally agree. So if anyone wants to get in contact with, with you then, Adib, um, to find out more about what Bamboo Orchard does and how you help people, how can they best reach you? Uh, bamboo Orchard or bamboo-orchard.com. Um, there is all our contact details are on that on that website and a, and a brief outline of the kind of services that we offer. Good stuff. And if we uh, tag you in the, uh, we, what we're going to do is we're going to publish this on LinkedIn, all things mm -hmm. going well. And if we tag you into that, um, people will be able to direct message you. Is that okay? Of course. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I love, I love receiving messages on LinkedIn. Weirdly, I like communicating with people on LinkedIn. Good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thanks so much, Adib. I really appreciate your time and catch up soon. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Phil. Take care. Bye.